I'd like to thank the organizers for kindly inviting me. And uh, I have nothing to uh, disclose. A recent article published by Massio in the Artificial Organs uh, Journal uh, documents or, or pictures the many different types of technologies that have been used to support children uh, with uh, various ventricular assist devices. And you see in these pictures, you see, you see paracorporeal pulsatile pumps, you see paracorporeal continuous flow pumps, you see, um, you see uh, implantable continuous flow pumps, and you also see a total artificial heart. What's important, to at least one of the pieces of information that's important, in my opinion anyhow, is if you look at all these technologies, only one of them, the Berlin Heart X-Core, was uh, studied prospectively in children and is labeled just that way. And th this point is uh, even more clearly uh, presented in a slide given to me by Dr. John Woodard, which shows in a large circle all of the technologies that are available for adults all the FDA approved devices plus the investigation of devices, all of that are available for treatment of cardiac failure in adult patients versus the dearth of technologies, the dearth of technology available for children, which is shown in the small, uh, in the small circle. Dr. Woodard also provided me a summary of the XCOR pediatric worldwide experience over 27 years that this pump is being used. And the data indicates more than 1,800 patients have been supported by the Berlin Heart across the world, with the longest time on device being more than three and a half years. Much of the information that I'll use uh, moving forward was taken from the recent publication by Bloom et al. on PDMAX in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation. And that data that uh, is presented in that publication is based on some 365 patients who were supported on various devices over the last five years. And when you look at the patient characteristics, you see quite a, a heterogeneous group uh, with the largest number of pump pay cases being for the children who are 11 to 19 years old, the adolescents, if you will, and the smallest number of cases being for the children who are less than five kilograms. And those are the children, of course, for whom no adult device is applicable. And according to Dr. Navaratnam et al., um, who reviewed the data from the Bloom paper, the primary reason for device implant was a decline in cardiac output, with the majority of patients either in cardiogenic, critical cardiogenic shock, intermax level one, or with a progressive decline in cardiac output, which is intermax level two. And the types of devices that are used, again, summarized in this slide from their paper, and you see the paracorporeal devices, primarily the Berlin Heart X score, the paracorporeal continuous devices, the Centromag pump. You see the implantable continuous pumps, the hardware HVAD and the heart P2. You see the percutaneous pumps that have been discussed these last several days, and the Syncardia total artificial heart. When you actually break that down, when you take these data and you break it down, what you see is for the patients who are less than one year old, the vast majority of the pumps that are used for them are the paracorporeal pumps, either the paracorporeal uh, pulsatile pumps in blue or the paracorporeal continuous pumps, which uh, perfusion pump, which are in orange. Contrast that to the pumps that are used for the adolescent patients, where you see that the vast majority of those pumps that are implanted in these, these adolescents are either the HeartMate 2 or the HVAD. So you can actually quantify that information, and it's shown here, which states that the patients who uh, receive for their cardiac support a pulsatile paracorporeal pump or a continuous flow paracorporeal pump, their mean age is 1.7 years old, less than two years old, while the, the adolescent children who receive the implantable HVAT or the implantable HeartMate 2, they're almost 15 years of age. And that has a significant impact on the ultimate results from this study. So for example, the first, the first um, and second columns of this table basically show that um, almost the, all of these pumps that are used for paracorporeal support are implanted in intermax level one patients or intermax level two patients. On the other hand, you can see that there's far fewer, uh, from a percentage point of view, implantable continuous pumps implanted in patients who are intermax level one. 
So what does that mean? And this is a busy slide, and I don't have I don't have time to go into it. But if you just focus on the the, uh, the big black arrow, what you see here is that blue line, and that blue line corresponds to the survival curve for the for the Intermax level one patients um, in the PDMAX paper. And basically, at six months, the survival is 50 percent. That's almost exactly the same survival percentage that you find in the Intermax paper, the recent Intermax paper for the adult patients that Dr. Cormis and I have just published. Um, and so roughly the same survival at six months. You also see similarities in terms of the serious adverse events and the, the, and the uh, challenges for these technologies, where the primary mode of death in the children are either neurologic dysfunction primarily or multi-system organ failure. Again, the same types of findings that we, that we know about for the adult patients. There are other interesting findings here as well because if you look at the, um, uh, these adverse events, and if, let's start with the uh, pericorporeal pulsatile, what you notice here is that there's uh, 13 strokes per 100 patient months Yet, on the other hand, for the implantable continuous, what you see is there's far fewer strokes per 100 patient months, which is a, would be anticipated considering the types of technology that are used um, for one classification of patient versus another. So the, the question that I was asked was, uh, do pediatrics respond differently to device therapies than adults? And in many ways, um, the answer is no we see the same basic actuarial survival curve at six months for the pediatric patients as well as for the adult patients. We see the same types of serious adverse events for the children versus the adults. We see the same challenges for the children as for the adults. But there is one area where there is a difference uh, in reviewing the papers. And that's in this particular curve, the orange line, where if you actually look in the competing outcomes for these, for these young children, and you'll notice that there's some 11% of these patients actually recover, these pediatric patients actually recover from their support. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, if you look for adult patients and you look at the recovery, that number is less than 1%. So there is a difference from a recovery point of view in terms of um, the outcomes for the children on these technologies versus the outcomes for adults. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Can I ask, do, do you see the same incidence of the SIRS syndrome, given the smaller caliber of the, of the devices? So the, 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 the pump that's most widely used is the uh, Berlin Heart X core. And as many of you know, that, that functions very much like a miniaturized Thoratec pump the PVAT pump. So it's a, it's a pumping bladder, it's a pulsatile pump. And the major challenge with that technology, and it is 27 years old now, so it's hardly a new technology, but it's been implanted, as the slide showed, in, in over 1,800 patients. The biggest challenge there has to do with the flow past the one-way valves. And so you have, you have a hemodynamic problem, and that's where you'll run into the thrombi, which become a significant problem in the clinical applications. Harvey, um, I spend a fair amount of time at Cincinnati Children's, and yes. we've uh, kind of flipped over and been using a lot of heart rate threes recently. Um, you alluded to uh, the stroke rate, which I you know, find a little concerning. Can you uh, help me drill down on what you, what you think that's from? Do you think it's from a difference in anticoagulation? Do you think it's related to blood pressure management? Do you think it's related to the pumps themselves? Or the pathophysiology of a child is just different than a, uh, an adult? So some of the answers to your question would uh, hopefully eventually be provided by the pumpkin trial, uh, the NIH pumpkin trial. So pumpkin stands for pumps for kids, infants, and neonates, and that was an NHLBI sponsored project uh, under the direction of Dr. Tim Baldwin. And basically as part of the clinical trial development, a particular protocol was developed for anticoagulation by the experts who who really went through all the literature to try to determine is there an optimum protocol for these, for these small pumps. For, for many of them, in Berlin Heart in particular, it, it's a hemodynamic problem. It's, it, the, flow, the flow is disturbed, especially around the valves, and so you actually see these thrombi, which is really the, the problem. I think you'll find, um, now the continuous flow pumps you saw 
the, the implantable uh, for HeartMate 2 or HVAD, you see a far fewer uh, stroke rate uh, because it's, a, it's, it's newer technology and, it, and as, as expected, it should hopefully provide fewer stroke rate uh, outcomes. I think w <clears throat> one of the other challenges that we have in the pediatric world is that m really the, the most used device is the Berlin Heart, which is a paracorporeal and pulsatile which has its own challenges with, I, I would say, higher challenges with regards to anticoagulation and much higher stroke rates than the <coughs> centrifugal continuous flow that we have. The problem is that, unfortunately, the you know it, it's also reflected by the number of transplants and VADs implanted worldwide for peds as opposed to adults, is that the, the numbers are also low because we just don't have the correct devices that we would like in the smaller patients. And the fact is that the industry just doesn't make those devices for us. And so, um, you know, be it a market problem, a uh, financial problem, or whatnot, the actual, you know, how do you say, motivation for us to be able to get those devices that we want to, which are probably going to be, I think with, with time and data it'll show, we want the continuous flow uh, centrifugal pumps, but they're not made for small enough uh, babies. We, we just don't have them, and so we're limited by them. Yeah, it's an excellent comment, and it's since the moderators have given me the next 200 days to talk about this with you, um, so, so this was realized by um, both Dr. John Watson and Dr. Tim Baldwin at NIH, and in 2004, they launched a, a program called Pediatric Circulatory Support, and they funded five projects um, to develop technology that is suitable for children as opposed to simply scaling down adult-type pumps for children. And then in 2010, again, NHLBI funded the pumpkin trial, which um, hopefully is going to begin doing its first clinical implants. Um, there are a number of groups around the world, and I'm proud to say our group at the University of Pittsburgh are working on pumps that are literally the size of a double-A cell battery that are, the si that are continuous flow in, in operation, and we believe will make a big difference. The challenge that you mentioned is 100% correct. Um, if you look, if you go to the International Society for Heart Lung Transplant, and you just look at their annual statistics, how many adult hearts are done per year, how many children, pediatric hearts are done per year, per year, it's no wonder that industry focuses on the adult marketplace. And so you require major university academic medical centers, you require the National Institutes of Health to fund this type of research because industry has not been very willing to submit, co commit significant funds for it. So, uh, great, great talk. Um, it seems that many centers are moving, to some extent, away from biventricular uh, support with Berlin X core towards in, in larger children in implantable continuous flow devices, uh, which would then be uh, uh, left-sided support alone. Uh, what is the experience with with uh, with secondary right ventricular failure in these children? Uh, is it common, and how is it managed? So there really, as you suggest, there really are no biventricular pumps under, under design, uh, at least that I'm aware of, uh, for pediatric applications. And if a child would need biventricular support, uh, the, the most likely scenario would be the centromag until the right heart would recover. Um, but, but clearly, the, the HVAD, uh, I mean, this is also uh, quite true. You have a 70 kilogram child, for example, and the HVAD will work in a child like that. Um, but you're talking about uh, you're, you're talking about uh, a requirement at least the BSA of the body surface area of the child has to be at least 0.7 square meters uh, for to consider any of these clinical adult type devices nowadays. <laughs> 